Hello, students of history and of life. Um, I'm Frank. I'm a person uh, with a degree in history and uh, a top tier level of expertise um, in that self same subject. Uh, so today uh, we're going to be discussing what any expert will tell you is a selection of the deadliest and most powerful trench and fighting knives of World War I. We also have a special treat. Uh, William, the trustee and founder of the McGovern Collection, um, is here with us on chat. Uh, the McGovern Collection is widely considered by true experts uh, to be the most impressive collection of antiques that exists in the world. Uh, it is also the source of the historical artifacts I will be teaching you about today. And I couldn't be happier uh, that I'm um, beholden to William for the existence of this educational program here. Uh, the rely on that, so that's good. Um, and I welcome William to chime in with questions or observations uh, when he feels they are entirely, entirely necessary. So feel free to do that if, you know, when you have to. Uh, anyway, so with this partial cutlass, I'm going to begin uh, the way that I begin when I give this lecture to uh, the, the K through sixth grade elementary students I teach. <clears throat> so when asked if he would say a few words about naval heritage, uh, having been a sailor himself, Winston Churchill said, naval heritage, naval heritage is rum, sodomy, and the lash. However, he couldn't have known that a naval, okay. Okay, William has chimed in here. Rum, sodomy, and the lash was the rat whore Churchill describing the Democrat convention. <laughs> Okay, yep, that's a fun point, um, but I prefer that we don't include politics um, in this. Uh, and I also um, uh, forgot that while William, uh, he, while he doesn't confuse Winston Churchill with uh, Joseph Stalin, he, um, he does raise uh, some very interesting and important points about the similarities between them. So connections that, that few other people have made. Um, oh, and he says, William says, Tell that to the 800 million people who died in Churchill's Siberian goulash. I think that's a little high. Uh, gulag, maybe? Do the antiques now. Okay. Uh, right. So onward. Uh, so anyway, so these are some of the most powerful examples of World War I trench knives in history. Um, I would know. Uh, I have an expert's degree in the subject. Um, I've chosen for this selection either knuckle knives or D-guard knives, um, those with a protective uh, or weaponized handguards. Um, the first uh, is this American military sword or saber that you've already seen, um, and this was cut down to function as a fighting knife. Um, and this was fairly common in both world wars. Um, oh, the, sorry, we have a, a trench. Yeah, it's gone. You leave that alone. Sorry, trench animals are extremely powerful. Um, and anyway, that was very common in both world wars. Um, the, the, uh, swords were, they weren't useful in trench warfare or really in, in war much anymore, but often an ancestor would have carried them into war. It was, it was maybe a family sword. Um, so that was cut down so that the, um, you know, their, their ancestor, the relative, um, their progeny could carry it into, into battle. Um, so this is an 1897 Pascal, uh, sword from San Francisco. Um, probably cut down for World War II. It's got this protective D guard here for the hand. Um, and, you know, swords had good steel. So they were, I mean, they functioned, you know, fairly effectively as knives. Um, and, uh, yeah, cut down for World War II, possibly World War I. Um, but the, the provenance we have suggests World War II. So, okay, oh, wait, William is saying, I bet Churchill liked San Francisco. Yeah, I... Don't even know. Well, I mean, yeah, I guess he might have. William, yeah, that's a good observation. Um, anyway, uh, Germans, uh, British, French, Italians, uh, lots of people did this in both wars on all sides. Um, the cutting down of swords for um, fighting knives is fairly common. So next, uh, we have a classic. We have the iconic American M1917 slash 1918 trench knife, the knuckle duster. Um, and uh, just to be clear, these are all originals. Um, the McGovern Collection does not traffic with reproductions. That's not how we do. So what I love about these knives and what is terrifying about them is just how utilitarian they are. Um, and here you can see you can see this here. That is from um, being put in and pulled out of the scabbard. Uh, that is a, a standard thing you find on these M1917 and 18 knives. Um, anyway, so these are. Uh, 
they're just you know they're they're they were made for one purpose there's no flash about them um this one has this it's got this studded d guard and oh wait okay in the chat william says churchill didn't guard his d from studs <laughs> yep right winston churchill though so that's the man we're discussing here um, anyway, so this is called the D guard because of the shape, you know, like a, like a capital D. Um, and so these, obviously, the the pommel here, you can see there's little there's a there's a stud on the pommel there, and then on the D guard, these are obviously offensive weapons um, for stunning soldiers. And then the blade, um, this you know, it's this triangular blade. I mean, this is purely a sort of thrusting, you know, penetrative weapon. Nope. Okay. Uh, but so these were built to defeat thick clothing um, and then cause deep puncture wounds. And puncture wounds are at best hard to treat. I mean, much, you know, much harder than a slashing wound. So these are all business. Um, however, uh, this was not um, super popular with soldiers uh, because it, it didn't do what soldiers use their fighting knives and bayonets for like 99% of the time. And that's like, you know, opening, uh, you know, tins of food or like cutting cloth and rope, or just, you know, whatever you use a knife for, and probably have to use a knife for more while you're at war, um, that this one wasn't really, you know, didn't really have a functional blade that you could do that with. Plus, um, being this shape and sort of thin, while they were effective at, you know, penetrating, they were, um, uh, they had a tendency to break. So that brings us to what is probably in fact, what is without doubt, it's agreed universally. I, I know, again, I'm in history circles I run, and I know these things um, because of my degree, uh, partially, also my research, um, that these are universally degree, agreed upon to be just the sort of baddest-ass trench knife, or knife, really, in the history of the world. Um, and it's the one that people tend to think of when they hear the words trench knife. Um, so this is the uh, legendary American Mark I trench knife. Let's see. All right, and we'll on there tight. Okay, so there's the blade. If you'll notice, if it looks a little dark to you, like it's got some soot on it, that is actually purposeful. Uh, these have been blackened so that they did not um, reflect uh, light when guys were creeping in no man's land at night with these over to so to bring some knife in over to the to the um, central powers. So again, um, all business. Um, and so this, I mean, this takes the offensive fighting knife to the next level. Um, so the, I mean, the guard here is literally spiked brass knuckles. Um, the, this pommel nut here, this is called, the, it's, they call this the nutcracker. And for, you know, for cracking, for cracking the nuts. Um, and then this, you know, as we've seen already, this strong, you know, sort of central, you know, it's got a, it's got a, just sort of a, anyway, just a sort of strong blade there. And that blade, as we have seen before, is based on the French uh, trench knife, the Avenger, the Le Vengeur. See, sort of extremely similar blade. Um, so what happened is, because the M1917-1918 um, trench knife was not very popular, in June of 1918, um, the Americans, that sort of army brass, got together to find a trench knife, a more functional trench knife, and um, among them was a trench knife largely designed by the French company uh, Olion, or it's A-U and then Lion, L-I-O-N. So it's either Olion or, or O-Lion, but that's, no one knows how to pronounce it anymore. Um, it's been uh, lost to history. If I, if I don't know it, then, it's, then no one does. So a few of the uh, French Olion versions of those knives made it into combat in World War I. But despite being thought of as World War I trench knives, um, these guys were mostly used by American GIs in uh, World War II, particularly the, the uh, kind I have. I don't have a, a um, well, the one I am lucky enough uh, to have on loan from the McGovern Collection. I do not have an uh, Oleone. I have the LF and C um, version, which is the more common kind that we find. Um, anyway, uh, so these are uh, obviously the world's sort of awesomest knife, um, and... They um, got a lot of use in World War II because they are the world's most powerful knives. Um, so finally, what we have here is a, um, we have this D-guard French nail style knife uh, from the North African campaign of World War I. 
Um, so along with its provenance, uh, we know that this is sort of a Moroccan and North African knife based on the um, North African design here on the D-guard. See, this is a classic Moroccan North African design. Um, and like so many of the French nail style trench knives, um, not unlike my thrusting bone dagger here, um, this is made from a uh, cut down bayonet. Um, and this is from a cut down spike bayonet, a label spike bayonet. Um, again, just all business. Uh, and um, the most amazing thing about this trench knife is here, let me find this. Let me show this to you. Okay, it's right here. <laughs> So if you can see that, you see that? So that is eight notches cut into the antler grip of this knife. That's right. Um, and so what does that mean? Uh, so the French, the absolute hard ass who owned this, who carved eight notches into it, um, does that mean he carried it into battle eight times or he went over the top eight times, um, over the top of the trenches? Or does it mean he used it eight times to dispatch German and Ottoman bad guys, their soldiers? And we all know the answer. It's the, it's the last one. Um, oh, wait. Okay. We got another chat here from William who says, Okay, what's the difference between Comrade Churchill and that trench knife? I don't know what the difference is. Okay. Oh, the trench knife only penetrated eight German and Turkish soldiers instead of eight battalions of them. Okay, well, uh, yeah, there, well, there's that. Okay, so um, I'm always happy to be able to share a fresh perspective, like the one that William inevitably provides when he chimes in, um, but I believe I'm going to call it a night there. Uh, so thank you for choosing to improve yourselves by learning from me, um, and I wish you the goodest of evenings, or whatever it is for you right now.